Okay, so let me introduce the next teleport. So, uh, the third speaker for today uh, from Mexico, and he'll uh, tell us about introduction to quantum toric geometry. Uh, so, this is your first uh, visit to Novosibirsk, yeah? Uh, so, uh, welcome. Uh, yeah, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, with virtual, you know, I would love to be there. But uh, but um, I'm very happy to be virtually or not. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited to speak. And my lectures, especially the first one, will be geared toward graduate students. Uh, uh, so I'll cover some material that is fairly standard, but I'll try to put it together to motivate. Uh, uh, quantum toric geometry and why would one would want to do this story. Uh, this is a joint work with Ludmil Katsarkov from uh, HSC and um, Laurent Merseman from uh, Angé and Alberto Berkowski from UNAM in Cuernavaca, Mexico. So you can see my point, right? Okay, let's start. So, uh, so this uh, uh, this lecture is based on three papers. Uh, the first one is from 2014, Contemporary Mathematics, and is the definition of a non-commutative toric variety. Second one is uh, from recently this year uh, and is called Non-Commutative Theory Indomitable to appear in the notices in January 2021. And in the, this one uh, is the one that is closest to the lecture today because this is one, uh, is an expository paper where I explain the main motivations and the main uh, foundations for this kind of mathematics. And uh, uh, finally, the, the technical uh, thick 100 page, well, 93 page paper that contains uh, details and uh, that, we'll, that we will consider uh, tomorrow in more, much more detail is this one. So uh, I recommend you to take a look at this one for the lecture of tomorrow. Uh, that is quantum non-commutative toric geometry. Today, I will assume some passing familiarity with classical toric geometry, as quantum toric geometry is a generalization of classical toric geometry. Uh, so, uh, so let's re recall some basic facts of classical toric geometry. So uh, here we have some basic structure uh, of a compact toric variety uh, over the complex numbers. Uh, I will always be working over the complex numbers. Some of these will have uh, uh, generalizations, of course, but just for clarity, uh, we will be working over the complex numbers. So, what was a classical complex torus variety? Well, we took the complex n dimensional torus. Uh, this is the one dimensional complex torus. It, uh, it contains uh, the, the uh, this one contains um, the circle as the complex numbers of modulus one uh, and so uh, it can be thought of as a complex uh, well it's a complexification of the torus uh, so this is a complexification of s1 so this is the complex torus uh, you would get the same by complexifying the Lie algebra and anyway uh, a toric variety is an equivariant compactification of the complex torus. Uh, so let's see an example. Uh, 
An, an example is uh, P1. Uh, this is a um, this is a topologically a two sphere, uh, and this is a complexification of the one dimensional torus, C star. Uh, uh, this was C star, so this is a complexification of the one dimensional torus. An equivalent compactification, we are the two points, zero and infinity. And we have the famous, and we will be, this will be important for us, we have the famous moment map that sends it to the real line. Uh, uh, but the image of the moment map is a, well, a one dimensional polytope, in this case it's an interval has a maximum, it has a minimum. Uh, the, and the inverse image of a typical point is a circle. That's the inverse image of a typical point. Of course, there is the inverse image of this one that is a point, and the inverse image of this that is a, another point. The vertices of the polytope. And, uh, and well, this is a, an example of the moment map, and this is a basic example of a toric variety. This example will be, even this simple example would be important for us uh, when we see the quantum toric varieties. Even quantum P1 will be interesting. But this is classical P1. Uh, more, a little bit more in general, uh, we, what we have is the moment map. This is the toric variety. That is an equivariant compactification of, uh, well, in this case, because it's R2, although I write it Rn, this would be of a two-dimensional complex torus, C star cross C star. It would be a four-dimensional real manifold, a two-dimensional complex manifold. And then we have this moment map, sends it to Rn, but actually to uh, to be more precise, actually, it sends it to Qn, in this case it's Q2, and, uh, um, so it sends it to Q2, and the image of, uh, of the moment map is always a rational polytope. That satisfies an additional combinatorial condition. Uh, in these cases, that every vertex has two linearly independent vectors coming out of it over Q. And in general, in the n dimensional case, is that every vertex has n linearly independent vectors over Q coming out of it. So we have this rational, so called Del Sand polytope, and this is the image of the moment map. Uh, this is what you remember from classical toric geometry. So we want to generalize this situation to quantum toric geometry. And what, what will happen is that if this is a quantum or non-commutative toric variety, then we will obtain here the same combinatorics, the same kind of polytope, but now it will not, not be restricted to, for it to be rational then it will uh, possibly be an irrational polytope. So we will have a freedom to move our toric varieties from the rational to the irrational case by quantizing them. In any case, in the classical case, I remind you now the inverse image of a typical point is this Lagrangian torus. And of course the inverse image of these sides will be these uh, spheres. Uh, so we have, this is the classical case, and we want to generalize this to the quantum or non-commutative case. So, but what is a non-commutative space anyway? Uh, so to motivate non-commutative spaces, let's state Gelfand duality. So what is Gelfand duality? Well, it says uh, that the category spaces of Hausdorff compact topological spaces and the category of uh, commutative C star algebras are the same. Uh, so, uh, well, the opposite of the category of commutative, this is a contravariant relation, a contravariant function. So uh, it's a usual thing. 
you have a topological space, it's corresponding algebra is the algebra of continuous complex valued functions on the topological space with pointwise multiplication to make it an algebra. So in this way, to every space, we can associate a C star algebra. And this establishes an equivalence of these two categories. Uh, I just remind you, uh, for beginners, that if you have a category, the opposite has the same objects, uh, but the arrows are all reversed. In any case, uh, in classical uh, algebraic geometry, one starts with an algebraic variety and produces a commutative algebra taking its regular functions. And then one can go back uh, uh, if one has the algebra to the space by taking the spectrum of maximal ideas. Well, more or less the same is happening here. It's a more delicate process because these are Hausdorff compact topological spaces. But there is a notion of a spectrum of this algebra with uh, some additional structure that recovers the topological space. So this is kind of a, a slightly more delicate version of this very well-known situation. Uh, so it is the same to uh, have a household compact topological spaces are easy to have uh, commutative C star algebras. In any case, uh, what are non-commutative spaces? Well, uh, remember in a commutative space, we have the algebra of functions. Uh, think of it as generated by some coordinates locally. And then we have xi, xj, xj, xi uh, on a non commutative space, uh, predictably, uh, xi, xj is not xj, xi. So you, you no longer can assume that the coordinates commute. Uh, so a very important example for us will be a non-commutative torus, also known as the quantum torus. Uh, torus uh, if a horizontal and vertical local chart will satisfy x, y equals almost y, x, but there will be this uh, scalar complex modulo one uh, factor for me, h bar is number that determines how non-commutative this algebra is, will be always real. And you, you are to think of it uh, as a physicist, uh, as a very small number, uh, so that when it is zero, indeed you recover the usual classical space, but as h bar departs from zero, and it's a very small constant, for example, then this becomes a slightly non-commutative and it becomes a quantum space uh, coming from quantum mechanics. Indeed, uh, this particular example really is the uh, exponential of the Heisenberg uh, born Jordan uh, introduction of non-commutative variables into quantum mechanics uh, that gave them the Nobel Prize in physics. So this is a very uh, important historical and geometric example for us. Uh, so uh, as a geometer and not as a physicist, uh, where are non-commutative spaces coming from? Often as a geometer, non-commutative spaces come from bad quotient spaces. A perfectly good topological house of space can have a non-house of uh, quotient. A perfectly good manifold acted on by a group can have a, a quotient that is not a manifold. Uh, this is a typical behavior when the group that is acting on your manifold or on your house of space is non compact. This is very typical behavior when the group is non compact. Uh, take, for example, the Kronecker foliation. So what is the Kronecker foliation? Well, you, to construct the torus, traditionally you take R2, and then you take an integral lattice, and then you take the quotient. So, uh, uh, so traditionally, uh, the usual two torus, but over the reals now, uh, if this is not the complex torus, but the real torus, uh, you can think of it as R2 divided by Z2. 
Z2. Uh, and this is a classical commutative torus, just, just the usual thing. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, we're, we're going to do something slightly different, and we're going to take this H bar that was the Planck's constant in, for the physicist, for us will be the slope of this foliation on R2. So we're going to take here this foliation. Uh, this is a foliation. By parallel lines uh, on R2, and we're going to descend these to the quotients. So when we do that, we get the Kronecker foliation on the two torus. So these lines are the images of the uh, line of these red lines on this foliation on R2. Uh, so uh, one of these, uh, one of these lines that go out and about and about and about and does something here and then continues and then does something here and then continues, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so forth. So uh, notice that this distance here, if I take one of these lines, see where, where it goes out and about, and it comes back, this distance here uh, is the holonomy, it measures how much it went, uh, it changed when it came back on this transversal. And this is H bar, essentially. So in the previous one, this slope measures this holonomy, how much it changed uh, as this line went and came back. And of course, H bar could be rational or h bar could be irrational. h bar is a real number, I insisted. So there is two cases, when it is rational, think, when it is rational, it goes back out and about, but it eventually comes back to this very same point and it closes up in a circle. When h bar is uh, rational, the leaps of this foliation are circles, are torus knots. So here we obtain torus knots. And when each bar is not rational, it goes out, uh, around, 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 it never comes back, and the leaves are mm, copies of the real line. But they are every leaf is dense in that case. Absolutely every leaf is dense. So, exercise uh, prove what I just said. For rational slopes, the quotient is Hausdorff and not over. It is a circle because we are dividing T2 by S1, that is S1 cross S1 by S1, and, and S1 cancels, so to speak, and we get S1. But for irrational slopes, we have that the quotient space now this is a non-compact group. As I explained before, this is bad usually. And this is a non hausdorff space. Uh, so we can profit from thinking of the second quotient as a non-commutative space. Let me explain that. This is our motivation for non-commutative spaces as geometers, not as quantum physicists. So, uh, to, to, I need to introduce this subject that will be very useful uh, uh, in the next lecture and in general, for us to think of this situation. There are groupoids. Uh, groupoids generalize groups. They are, they are more general than groups, but they're also more general than group actions. So, uh, I just remind you, a groupoid is a certain kind of category. It's a category where every 
arrow, every morphism of the category, every arrow has an inverse. In any case, a category, uh, uh, very quickly, well, uh, has objects, has arrows. Uh, this is a typical arrow on the category, uh, written like this or like this. And uh, the source of this arrow, S of A alpha, is X. The target of this arrow is Y in this typical arrow. There is all these special arrows, the, the identities. Um, but more importantly, there is a composition of arrows. So I can take one arrow, I can take another arrow. So I have three objects here. And I happen to have an arrow that goes from this to this, and an arrow that goes to this. Then we have first this arrow, and then this arrow, this is the composition law. And it's uh, uh, just, uh, is the multiplication in the category. Just the, as there is a multiplication in a group, this is the multiplication in the category. Uh, uh, in the category, we are more interested in the arrows than we are in the objects. So you can think of a group as a category with only one object, a unique object, but then we have many arrows. Every element of the group is an arrow. And the multiplication uh, can be written as the composition, if you prefer. And so you can think of a group as a category, a special kind of category. And uh, categories uh, generalizing monoids because they don't necessarily have inverses. So uh, semi-groups or monoids are generalized by categories. In any case, the composition does satisfy some actions that are important, associativity and commutativity. Uh, no, commutativity, no, that's wrong. What did I write? Uh, identity. Uh, in fact, this is extremely important. In general, this doesn't even make sense. If this makes sense, this may not even make sense, remember. In this case, this wouldn't make sense. Uh, I know. This would make sense, and this would not make sense. So careful with that. There is no commutativity, there is identity. Uh, so uh, this is the diagram for uh, associativity. All these, all these triangles are commutative. It is the same to compose this first two than this, as it is the same as con compose these two and this. And this is the associativity. This is the most important law of the category and of the groupoid. Uh, if the arrows happen to have inverses, it's called a groupoid. And, uh, uh, well, it, 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 is pro it is profitable to think of this associativity in terms of this tetrahedron rather than of this uh, convoluted looking diagram. Uh, you put it uh, as a tetrahedron is far more understandable. So this is F first and then G and then H. And what you want is that all the sides of the tetrahedron, uh, that the whole thing commutes. There is all the sides of the tetrahedron. And there is the same to go this and then like this, that the whole diagram commutes. Uh, all the sides of the tetrahedron commute. Uh, so uh, it is easier to see it as a tetrahedron. To put it as a tetrahedron is useful as well because uh, groupoids are related to the structure, the geometric structure of spaces. They not only generalize groups, but uh, when you are forming a space, often you, uh, you have all these open sets and then uh, uh, you have all these open sets going around and they glue a space uh, in a particular fashion. Uh-oh, I don't know what I did. Uh, let's say that there was a hole here in the space. This was not a part of the space. Uh, so well, you start gluing the space in a particular fashion. 
here many open sets uh, uh, collided together and uh, a groupoid will allow you to recover the structure of this space as we will see uh, in an example further down the road. You, but just have this picture in mind that the, that, that the associativity in a category, this tetrahedron is related to this tetrahedron when you are gluing a space uh, by different uh, open sets, by three open sets or more. Or, or more. So uh, in any case, uh, of course, categories have morphisms between them. They are called functors and it is what you would expect it to be, nothing else. Uh, so this is, well, a functor sends object to objects and sends arrows to arrows. Uh, and objects, there is essentially no restriction. Again, the algebraic structure of a functor comes from the, as, uh, the, from the composition law. It is important that it sends arrows to arrows, but it sends the composition to the composition. Uh, so once you have a category, you can sort of do an internal logic. This is even more dramatic in when the category is a topos. Uh, and, and this is important. Uh, we will end up with some toposes actually uh, coming from a groupoid. But, uh, but for now, just think that there is this fact that you can say internally in the so-called logic of the category. And so you have this, uh, you can say what is an isomorphism between two objects, just with the structure of the composition law, nothing else. You don't have to go down into the elements. <coughs> and in fact, the objects may not be sets. They may be just abstract objects. They don't need to be sets. So this generalizes set theory into uh, having properties of the classical set theory, like uh, bijections. But now uh, these objects need not be sets. Uh, well, yeah, set theory is indeed a category, but there is categories that are not set theory. There is other logics that is not set theory. You can think of set theory as a kind of logic and as a category, as a generalized kind of logic. Uh, and it is also profitable to think as a group point in that way. So there is all these ways to see this elephant. Uh, and it's important that you get used with all of them. In any case, a group point has objects and has arrows. And uh, 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 well, no, no, this is the category of all groups. So this is categories that are big categories. They have these kind of classes of objects and arrows. Uh, uh, well, I will give, because of time, I will start skipping a little bit. The, this is a bit of the history of category theory. But anyway, what is important for us is that functors, just like functions between topological spaces have homotopies between them, functors have homotopies between them. So uh, how do I construct a homotopy, also called a natural transformation between two functors? Well, I consider this interval category that has an initial object, a final object, has this arrow, this arrow, and this arrow. You can check that there is only one way to make this graph into a category. This arrow composed with this is this, this are composed with this is this, this with this is this, and this with this is this. That's all. So this is a very tiny category that is uh, meant to be a combinatorial, uh, a combinatorial version of the unit interval. So this is a combinatorial version of the unit interval, and we see it as a category. And now we give ourselves two functors. We give ourselves two functors. Well, a natural transformation or homotopy between these two functors is, as you would expect, a functor from this product category. So what is the product of two categories? Well, it has objects, a Cartesian product of the objects of this category with the objects of this category. And because this category had two objects, has just twice as many objects as this category, and has as arrows, the product of the arrows, and the source is the product is the obvious thing. So exercise makes sense of this product and then makes sense of this definition and prove that this definition coincides 
with the classical definition of natural transformation that you find in the Wikipedia or in the books. Anyway, uh, this definition uh, interprets a natural transformation as a homotopy of functors. Uh, and this is uh, a useful way to think about it. Uh, in any case, uh, well, because just as homotopies can be composed, uh, natural transformation can be composed and, uh, and we can define the analogous of a homotopy equivalence within categories and it's called a natural equivalence. Uh, think of it as a homotopy equivalence between categories. You are to have a natural transform, you are to have two functors and now a natural transformation from one to the other a natural transformation from the other to the one, and these compositions uh, have to, well, uh, compose to say the identity, so to speak. Uh, and this produces a, a, a natural equivalence or homotopy equivalence of two categories. In any case, uh, equivalent categories can have vastly different number of objects, just like homotopy uh, equivalent spaces uh, can have vastly different uh, uh, quantity of objects. Uh, this, ho this space that is a full disk is homotopy equivalent to one point and they have vastly, this is uncountable and this is finite. So the same happens. Uh, it could be that these categories uh, huge or small, you can fatten it up like this. You could do this and then you could do this. This could be C, this could be A, and then this could be B, and this could be a, this interval here. For spaces. And for categories, the same happens. Uh, categories that look uh, very, very different uh, can can be a equivalent categories okay. by fattening and making it thinner. How do we make thinner in a category? We take off objects that are, are some, uh, that are isomorphic to objects that are already present in there. So we can uh, fatten and thin out a category and get equivalent categories. So for example, consider the category uh, complex n-dimensional vector spaces. Complex n-dimensional vector spaces together with linear isomorphisms, not all linear mappings, just linear isomorphisms. It's still a category, it's a groupoid. Every arrow has an inverse. And this is not hard to see that, well, you can take off every vector, every uh, uh, other vector space in the world of dimension uh, of dimension n and just leave one of them, let's say cn, only one of them, and then uh, yeah, let this group act there, and then this category that is comes from a group, it has one object, that is cn, but it doesn't matter what the object is, and it has all these invertible matrices as arrows, this one is uh, a category equivalent to the category of complex n-dimensional vector spaces. And so this huge uh, category is equivalent to a group OID and actually to a group, just GL and C, just that a, a small category is equivalent to that huge category. So group OIDs, well, I already said it, in the internal logic of the category, I ask that every single arrow has an inverse. Every single arrow has, not every category satisfies this. Uh, vector spaces with all linear mappings would not be a groupoid, uh, but vector spaces with isomorphisms is a groupoid. Uh, so every group can be made into a groupoid. Uh, as I said, it's what I already said. We put one object and we put an arrow for every uh, element of the group. And we are careful to invert the, oh, I think I wrote it the other way around. It doesn't really matter. 
Uh, more generally, for example, uh, every equivalence relation can be made into a groupoid. So how do you make an equivalence relation into a groupoid? Well, uh, you, the objects of your category are the elements of the set where the equivalence relation is happening. These are the objects of your category. And the arrows of the category, well, if X and Y are equivalent, we put one arrow uh, in every direction like this. This is the tiny subcategory just with two equivalent uh, objects. Uh, and this is, uh, I, so I would call this I and J. And if this is I and this is J, the arrow that relates them, I just call I comma J. And this is the composition law that occurs because of transitivity of the equivalence relation. And then this becomes a groupoid. And I denote it by this symbol. This is a groupoid. Uh, and I denote it by that symbol. Uh, so uh, every group action that also produces a groupoid the translation groupoid, if I have M and I have GM, I put an arrow called M comma G for the group action where G is acting on M. On the right and uh, this is the composition law, so that if I have HGM, well, this would be the arrow uh, GM H, and this would be the arrow MHG, and that would give this composition law. So every group action produces a group oid, and uh, this is very important for us. Every group action produces a group oid. If I group oids, interpretation can be thought of as uh, local group actions. Think of an orbifold. Local group actions where the group changes around. We will see it in a minute in more detail. So, you, but you can think of group points also as local group actions. Late, but it's small. If these and these are sets, the category of all the sets is not a small category because the all sets is not a set. Uh, and we will concentrate now on the small categories mostly. Uh, uh, but uh, any category generates lots of groups. For every object, there is a group uh, called the automorphism group of X. And this is a group that changes around. So you think of all the objects around objects as the points of a space. You think of all the objects as the points of space. And every object carries a little group that is the automorphism group of X. And what is the automorphism group of X? Well, the set of all arrows that go X from X to X that are invertible. If C is, is a groupoid, then all arrows that go from X to X form a group and is the automorphism group of X. Uh, uh. Now, to produce non-commutative spaces, we have to take seriously these uh, moving around objects, moving around objects. So what we are going to do is that we are going to th think of a very space, just like groups, there's discrete groups and then there is Lie groups, uh, there is Lie groups, and in 
that kg is a manifold and a group for Lie groups. For Lie groupoids, Lie groupoids, uh, you have a groupoid, but G0 and G1 are manifolds. G0 and G1 are manifolds. And the structure maps are C infinity, smooth. The structure maps are C infinity. Uh, so uh, the multiplication of two, uh, so if I have the multiplication that goes from arrows to arrows, but not all, uh, I cannot multiply every arrow. The target of this arrow has to be equal to the source of this arrow and it goes to arrows. This is a C infinity map. This has to be a manifold then. You have to ensure that this is a manifold. Uh, it is a fiber product of manifolds. So you have to ask for S and T to be submersions or something for these to be a manifolds. So these are Lie groupoids, a small categories in which the objects and the arrows are manifolds. I, uh, to illustrate uh, the situation, let me describe a tal groupoids, although this will be uh, less important for us but it helps to illustrate the point. A map is et al in the differential category if it is a local diffeomorphism. So locally, it looks like this is the map. This is the map, it looks like this. Locally, looks like this, the map. Uh, and, uh, well, if S is et al, then we call this Lie group point et al. Uh, you have to sit down and think about this one. Uh, uh, why are we putting these conditions, these technical conditions? Because we will be using foliations. Remember, we had this uh, Kronecker foliation. And then we will be assigning to a foliation a groupoid, and we can change this groupoid by an etal groupoid, and then we can associate to it a non-commutative algebra. Once it is etal, it's easier if it is etal to associate a non-commutative algebra, and so from a foliation, I will obtain a non-commutative space. Uh, a non-commutative algebra is more or less the same as a non-commutative space because a commutative algebra is more or less the same that, that a space is. Uh, so, uh, a league, uh, for example, a Lie groupoid that comes from a group action is called a translation groupoid, and it is a tal whenever G is discrete. So, uh, in the Kronecker foliation, there was no hope that the group action, it was R acting on a torus. So this was the group and it's not discrete. But I can change, uh, if I take a transversal, just this circle that is a transversal, just this circle that cuts the torus, then I can change the action of R into an action of Z, holonomy. And now it becomes a discrete group. It doesn't become a finite group. It's not quite an orbifold, but it becomes a discrete group. And then this groupoid becomes et al. This was not et al. This was not et al not et al, but it became et al by equivalence of categories because this is an equivalence of categories. It's, a, it's not a homotopy equivalence spatially, but it is an equivalence of categories. In any case, uh, that's et al groupoids, and they are motivated by 
using holonomy on foliations. In any case, for any manifold in the world, if we choose an atlas, and it depends on the choice of the atlas, we can form a etal groupoid whose objects are pairs of points together with remembering which chart the point is located at, and arrows. This is an object. It remembers that this is in UI. This is an object. It remembers that it is in UJ. And this is an arrow. And the arrow remembers that you are taking this representation of the point in the manifold in the chart I to this representation on the chart J. And this is the composition of the arrows. And it's an exercise to show that this is an etal groupoid, Lie groupoid et al. Lee Groupoid, associated to an atlas of a manifold. In general, an et al. Groupoid is an atlas of a stack. So, just as there was equivalence of categories, these are categories after all, we have to geometrize equivalence of categories and you can do it. This is, an, uh, you have to do well, subjective submensions and that kind of thing. It's not hard uh, to, uh, to geometrize equivalence of categories. So it's the geometrization of equivalence of categories. Just think of it today as equivalence of categories. So this is equivalence of groupoids and it's called uh, Morita equivalence. So uh, we can take a groupoid, fatten it up, thin it out, and we have this equivalence. Think of them as atlases of a stack, whatever a stack is. And this is a more refined atlas, and this is a less refined atlas. All of them are groupoids. So just as a manifold was the equivalence a class of uh, atlases on their refinement, uh, an essential equivalence could be thought of as a refinement. An essential equivalence could be thought of as a refinement of stack atlases. And anyway, our definition is that uh, the equivalence class of a groupoid under Morita equivalence is the C infinity stack associated to the groupoid. Many groupoids could have the same C infinity stack associated to it, just like many atlases could have the same manifold associated to them. For example, given a fixed manifold and two atlases, we get two groupoids associated to do atlases, two etal groupoids, and they are Morita equivalents if and only if the atlases are equivalents in the sense of refinement. Uh, M itself is the stack associated to these two groupoids. M is the stack associated to this groupoid, and M is the stack associated to this. Manifolds are inside C infinity stack. Stacks are more like orbifolds uh, because now every point of a stack, uh, think of it as an equivalence class of, uh, if I had a group point representing the stack, think an object on the group point, an equivalence class of an object on the group point is a point in the stack, so to speak. And of course it has this automorphism local group so it looks a little bit like an orbifold, except that these groups need not be finite. So the stack looks like an orbifold, but it, the, the local groups need, need not be finite. Uh, so there is a stack associated to foliations. Think of the Kronecker foliation. So think of a foliated manifold. Think of the Kronecker foliation. Think of the torus with the Kronecker foliation. Uh, uh, and then think of the holonomy 
of the foliation that is taking this transversal and now letting act this, this holonomy that is this, this, this rotation by H bar. This is the rotation by H bar. Uh, so where we can find two groupoids, the original groupoid that is the category that has objects that points in the torus and arrows, one arrow if they belong to the same lead, it's an equivalent relation, it's an equivalent relation groupoid. And this other groupoid, uh, the holonomy groupoid, that is equivalent to this not et al groupoid. So now we have an et al groupoid. Uh, Morita equivalent to an et al groupoid by taking a transversal, as I said. Uh, and then, well, this et al groupoid, that is the one that we take a transversal, is the groupoid that we will associate to the foliation, and now it's an etal groupoid. So foliations go to etal groupoids. And I recommend this book uh, for this. In any case, uh, now we have an etal groupoid. So we have foliations a tal groupoid by taking a transversal, and now we want to obtain an algebra, usually non-commutative. And, uh, well, this is, if it was a group, this would be the group algebra. But it is not a group, it is a groupoid, and it's called the convolution algebra. This is the convolution algebra of the groupoid. Of the groupoid, and this is the groupoid, and to the groupoid I associate, and this is the holonomy groupoid. If I have a foliation, I say the holonomy groupoid, and if I have a groupoid, I associate the convolution algebra, and because it is a tal, everything is okie dokie. And so we get a non-commutative algebra. A non-commutative algebra associated to a groupoid and to a foliation ultimately. So examples, uh, if we have a discrete group, the convolution algebra is the group algebra. It is also works for a Lie group, but you, you have to be careful for a compact Lie group. Uh, but anyway, for a discrete group, it's clear this is the, the analogous to et al groupoid. And then we get a group algebra. Uh, if we had a more general kind of groupoid, we would need to do very specific kind of integral, not summation. <coughs> Uh, now, if we get, what is the Heisenberg groupoid? It is, we just take a set, say a countable set, and we just put an arrow between one, only one arrow, i comma j, between i and j, only one. Uh, this is a tetrahedron of arrows. Uh, so, uh, well, if we do the group algebra, the, group, the, the convolution algebra of this group point, given by this equivalence relation that relates everything to everything, we get the usual matrix algebra. So the matrix algebra is the convolution algebra of a groupoid, the Heisenberg groupoid, coming from quantum mechanics. Now, we need not only categories, we need two categories. 
two, two categories have objects uh, and uh, think of the category of categories. It has objects which are categories. It has arrows which are functors. And it has two arrows who are natural transformations. These are objects. These are arrows. And these are two arrows. The category of categories is a two category. It's a two category. The category of groupoids is a, also a two category. Uh, but also the category of algebras. This is a little bit more surprising. So what's going on? Uh, well, the category of algebras, for uh, groupoids is no, not a surprise. For algebras, uh, we take non-commutative algebras as objects, bimodules as arrows, and bimodule morphisms as two arrows. So uh, we have two algebras, these are objects, and an arrow between them is a bimodule. And if I have two bimodules, the composition is the tensor product. Tensor product. This is the composition of arrows in these two categories. So uh, this is the composition of arrows in these two categories. And uh, isomorphism in this category will, means finding two modules so that this is like this, and this is like this. Exercise. This is what isomorphisms of algebras. I, I'm not using usual morphisms of algebras. I'm using bimodules as morphisms of algebras. So they are isomorphic. Well, to avoid confusion with usual isomorphism, this is called Morita equivalence. And it is the same as asking that these two categories of modules are equivalent. Exercise. In the commutative case, there is no difference. But in the non-commutative case, there is a difference. Uh, so well, in any case, the convolution algebra gives me a function. but it's a two functor. So it respects Morita equivalence. This equivalence of categories here is sent to <coughs> Morita equivalence of algebras here. And so, well, uh, uh, I guess I should stop now. Uh, I have much more to say before I get to quantum toric uh, varieties. Let me just say very quickly, that, uh, well, we will see non-commutative spaces more carefully. This is a preview of what we will see. But this in, I will go now very fast because I'm very, obviously very behind. But then we will see the non-commutative torus and we'll see what, what this represents. And what is quantum toric geometry? Well, quantum toric geometry, remember, classical toric geometry was made up of tori the inverse image of a point, the inverse image of a point in the moment map was a torus, a Lagrangian torus. Well, I'm going to replace this by non-commutative tori, quantum tori, coming from the Kronecker foliation. So I will foliate all this story. And I will do this using LBM theory. 
I will foliate all this story to get LBM theory, and this foliation will give me some non commutative spaces. Toric manifolds, non commutative toric manifolds. So, uh, but that will happen tomorrow. So I will stop now and ask if there is any questions. Excellent, no questions today. Well, today was fairly basic. Uh, tomorrow I will uh, accelerate and, uh, but I, I recommend you to see if you are students to whom this course is addressed. Uh, I recommend you to see uh, in advance for tomorrow, uh, Uh, this one, take a look at this one, but especially take a look at least at the introduction of this one. And if you don't remember your, uh, your, uh, if you don't remember your classical toric geometry, uh, uh, browse Fulton's book at least the first chapter before we go into tomorrow. Uh, basic toric geometry. So I will use the language of basic toric geometry, fans and that kind of thing. So, um, well, thank you very much for today.